Welcome to this course on multivariate analysis. In this course, we're going to be discussing a number of techniques that are going to provide you with a rich set of tools to analyze very complex data. Now, multivariate analysis is very different from univariate because it examines the interrelatedness between and within sets of variables. And mostly we're going to focus on the covariance of the variables, but we have other techniques that will use different methods as well. The key is that multivariate analysis exposes the structure and the meaning of the data from the application and the interpretation of various statistical methods beyond what you might see in a basic statistics course. So for example, we're focused in basic statistics with a regression or say with a t-test or an ANOVA. Here, we're going to be looking at the combinations of variables and combinations of responses simultaneously. So it focuses on the many variables within a data set. We're not just focused on one particular outcome. Multivariate statistical analysis focuses on establishing the relationship among the set of variables and or grouping entities into distinct subgroups. Now, the difference between univariate and multivariate is pretty straightforward. Univariate focuses on a single dependent variable, and that's what we're going to consider. Some do consider any data set with multiple variables as multivariate, but here in this course, we're going to prefer the term as multivariate as dealing with multiple variables, especially when considering multiple dependent variables. And in this case, we may also focus on things like structured and unstructured learning, whereas we're looking at the entire data set completely and having the data analyze various components or subgroups within it. So here we might have data in terms of different variables of A1, A2, A3, and so forth. And the multivariate will deal with the larger set of many variables, which we'll call X1, X2, X3. And generally it'll be in this table format. But we won't focus on one particular response, such as X1. We'll focus on how X1 through X3 relate to X4 through X6. Now, the goal of the multivariate analysis primary goal, I would say, is data reduction. We want to identify one or a few new variables that capture most of the variability or variance in a large data set. We'll also have functions that will help us with sorting and grouping so we can develop rules for splitting a large data set into relatively homogeneous groups. We'll also explore the concept of dependence, which will characterize relationships among variables. And we'll look at this as a prediction. But in the predictions, we're not going to focus on predicting one variable. We'll focus on dealing with multiple variables that we will predict. And finally, in a classical sense, a statistical sense, we'll focus on hypothesis testing of multiple responses simultaneously in a designed experiment. Now, when should we use multivariate techniques? Well, the first one is complexity. When the subject that we're studying is more complex than what univariate methods generally offer. So, for example, if we're dealing with psychology, we may want to understand a person's motivation and self-control and self-efficacy simultaneously, as opposed to just exploring things in a silo. Multivariate techniques also provide a high degree of reality, because in some cases, it would be inappropriate to conduct a single univariate analysis, as the data demands a multivariate analysis such as when we talk about things that are going to co-vary with each other, such as grade scores and self-efficacy. Now, experiments versus empirical data. In experimental data, generally it manipulates a single variable, making univariate analysis easier to imply some causality. But with empirical data, that's not always the case, such as crime or census data. And therefore, it may require multivariate analysis for a better correlation or covariance analysis. Now, the history of multivariate techniques and why they weren't widely used is because it was much harder to do because of the lack of statistical computing as well as the research that was done inside of it. You have probably a good 50 years worth of statistical mathematical theory associated with multivariate analysis, but again, it takes a while for the books and the classes to get caught up. And in addition, it required a large uh, amount of statistical computing power. So... With the advent of computers and PCs, obviously in the 70s and further in the 80s, uh, it became a little bit easier to perform some of these tasks. And now we have a great amount of computing power at our fingertips to actually do some of these analyses. Now, one of the things that we need to caution about multivariate analysis is there could be a degree of ambiguity. It may result in a less clear understanding of the data. 
For example, group differences on linear combinations of dependent variables, say in a MANOVA. In other words, the, the analysis may not be very clear because we're analyzing multiple variables simultaneously, so the interpretation becomes a little bit more difficult. It's often sometimes easier to explain group differences in a univariate context, such as male and female and test scores, or uh, undergraduate, graduate in terms of salary. But when we start talking about things like, you know, the graduate and undergraduate, and we look at things like salary and type of job and potentially, uh, you know, grade point average and so forth, all of those things begin to play into your analysis and may make it a little bit more difficult to interpret. Just as the reason we use multivariate analysis for complexity, complexity is also a question. Just because a technique is popular doesn't mean you need to use it. You know, it's like using a tank to destroy a wall. And they, there are very good and strong and robust techniques, but it may not be appropriate to use it in all situations. Key on the assumptions is multivariate analysis do, do have rules and assumptions just like univariate analysis. Most of them will stem from the fact that they do assume multivariate normal distribution, uh, and we'll be focused on that in this course as well. Some of the advantages to multivariate are you have a richer and more realistic design. It looks at phenomena in an overarching way by providing multiple levels of analysis. Each method will actually differ in the amount or type of the independent variable and dependent variable. But one of the key things is that it will help control for a type 1 error, and we'll see this later on in the course as we begin to understand more about why we're using multivariate analysis. This concept of type 1 error uh, is an issue when we have covariates in terms of two response variables that seem to covary with each other. This will give us a much better view of our hypothesis test and when we should reject the null hypothesis. Now some of the disadvantages are that larger ends are often required. If we're going to be doing more complex analysis, it's going to be important for you to actually have a larger set of observations. It is also more difficult to interpret these results as we mentioned before. And the other thing is less is known about the robustness of assumptions. As we said, this is fairly relatively new, let's say about 50 or 60 years for some of these techniques, and some even more recent than that. And so we don't necessarily know a lot about the assumptions as more theory work is being done uh, by academics. So some foundations for this class, uh, we have technology. We're going to be measuring several variables for each item in a sample. So we'll say P variables for N items or N observations. We'll have a notation of X sub J K, which is a measurement of the Kth variable on the Jth item. Again, we'll do rows and columns in terms of these notations. And a data array is where columns are the variables and observations are the rows. Going back to a review of some univariate analysis, we'll use some of the same definitions. So for example, the population is the entire set of members in a group, or a definable group, say all US citizens. And a sample is a subset of that population. Now from a sample, we may have a probability sample, which is a subset of the population for which all members had a known non-zero probability for inclusion. This might be a weighted sample. And we might do something like this by saying, uh, we know that we need 50% uh, male and 50% uh, female, or we know we would need 80% uh, of one demographic group, 20% of another demographic group. This would be a weighted sample. Now, pure random sample is a subset of the population for which all members had an equal probability of inclusion in the sample. A random variable, usually written as capital X, is a variable whose possible values are numerical outcomes of some random phenomena. So it would be grade point average, or grades on a test, or even uh, whether someone votes for one particular party or another. This would be a numerical outcome of a random phenomenon. A discrete random variable may take on only a countable number of distinct values, such as 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. The examples might be number of children, patients at a hospital, or number of bank loans in a particular hour. A continuous random variable is one in which takes an infinite number of possible values, such as height, weight, and speed. And one of the things that we say for a continuous variable is that the numbers between the numbers actually have meaning. So for example, if we're looking at someone's height, we may say that someone is 54 inches, someone is 54 and a half inches, someone is 54.52 inches. The numbers between the numbers have meaning. 
And the other thing we usually say is when we're talking about countable, a uh, good rule of thumb is if you're counting on your fingers, if you uh, have a variable that you can count the number on your fingers, maybe your toes as well, uh, then it's countable and discrete. Otherwise, you can probably treat it as numerical. So a recap of some statistical definitions again, we're going to talk about probability distributions. Now, the probability distribution for a discrete random variable is a list of probabilities associated with each of its possible values, called the probability function or the probability mass function, something like a binomial distribution. Uh, the graph on the bottom left is a probability mass function for each discrete value. So for 1, there's a 20% chance of it coming up. For 3, there's a 50% chance. And a 7, there's a 30% chance. But no other values can possibly come up. For a continuous random variable, we have a density function. And here we'll say something like the normal distribution. And you can see the various elements of the normal distribution with different variances and different means. Moments are a qualitative measure of the shape of a set of points. And this begins the concept of understanding what our data looks like. Now, when we say looks like, it's sometimes nice to look at it in a graph. But again, we're trying to create a, a concept of the shape. We'll use different moments to begin to inform us about the overall shape of the data. So if the points represent mass, then the zeroth moment is the total mass. The first moment will be the center of mass. And these are known as the raw moments or the moments around zero. So let's get a better explanation of that. Let's say you have a set of data represented by x. The zeroth moment represents the total set of data, not its sum, which is one, which is everything. And we would denote this by the expected value of x zero here in the middle of the notation down at the bottom. So what's interesting is that if we set the expected value of x zero, that would be the zeroth moment. And anything to the zero power is one. And so therefore, the expected value of one is one. Now, we can derive this notation by looking at the line above it, where we say, well, if we have the expected value of a random variable x, we know that everything should have a power to one if there is no exponent. And the expected value of x is mu. It is the mean. So this is the first row moment around zero. And that's how we can then conclude that if we have an exponent of 1, there is the possibility of an exponent of 0. And we call that the zeroth moment. And that represents the full mass. And if we recall from probability, all sets of probabilities would represent 1. And so that's where we have our uh, probability mass function. Similarly, if we go in the opposite direction and we say x to the power of 2, this would be the second raw moment around 0. And it's not really significant for this lecture, but we'll alter this in a moment. Now, central moments represent the moments around the mean, not zero, as was the case of the raw moments, because this is the key concept for us, are these central moments. We want to know how things behave or what the shape of this data is around its center point or center of mass, which we'll represent as the mean. So these central moments are significant because they do describe the function or this probability distribution around the mean. So we do the notation here as the expected value of x minus mu, so the particular x variable or identity, or the particular x minus its average squared, which is going to be equal to the variance. And this is the second central moment. So we'll know this as our second central moment, which is the variance. Now we'll do the same thing for the third and the fourth moment around the mean, and it'll give us some more information about the behavior of that distribution around the mean. So central moments will tell us information about the spread and shape of a distribution, especially the higher order moments. Now if we standardize the moments with respect to the standard deviation, thus the standard moment then becomes a scale invariant, meaning that the scale has no effect. We are basically using uh, this concept of the standard deviation to tell us about the data. And we can then use that in comparison with another data set, which is on a different scale. So the scale doesn't have any meaning at this point. Thus, the kth central moment is defined as the expected value of x minus mu to the kth power divided by the standard deviation to the kth power. If we look at the first formula here, we have the expected value of x minus mu squared divided by sigma squared. 
This is the standardized second central moment, which is equivalent to the variance divided by the variance. So therefore, the, second, the standardized second central moment is 1. Now, if we take the sec standardized third central moment, it would be the expected value of x minus mu to the third power divided by the standard deviation to the third power. And we do the same thing for the fourth central moment. So the two standardized moments that are of special note are the skewness and the kurtosis. The skewness is a measure of the asymmetry of the probability distribution. And so therefore, we have the expected value of x minus mu to the third power divided by the standard deviation to the third power. So if we have a negative skew, and we have that means that the tail is on the left side, we have our mean is less than our median. And if we have a positive skew where the tail is on the right side, our mean will be greater than the median. So it tells us kind of how the bell kind of leans. Does it lean to the left or does it lean to the right? Now, another statistical measure is the fourth moment, which is the kurtosis, which measures the tail extremity, which is really an analysis of the outliers or propensity of outliers in relation to the mean. This is the focus on outlier. Thus, the focus is on the outliers. A lot of statistical books will actually indicate it's the shape of the curve, but as written in a paper by uh, Westfall, uh, which I'll post on the Blackboard site, uh, it's really about the outliers. And he argues in the paper uh, successfully that the kurtosis really tells you nothing about the shape of the curve, but rather it tells you about the propensity of outliers, of extreme outliers in a data set. And that's really critical if you're working with a large data set. We have three types of kurtosis, leptokurtic, which is one in which produces fewer and less extreme outliers than the normal distribution. Mesokurtic, which produces similar outliers, even extreme to a normal distribution. And platokurtic, which will produce more and more extreme outliers than a normal distribution. So a question about the fourth central moment here, this kurtosis, is much of the statistical literature and books refer to it as the peakedness of the distribution. Westfall has provided a robust rationale of why this is incorrect and why the only unambiguous interpretation is in terms of tail extremity. That is, either existing outliers for the sample kurtosis or the propensity to produce outliers for the kurtosis of a probability distribution. And it should be somewhat clear from the formula. If we take a look at this formula, you have the expected value of x minus mu to the fourth power divided by the standard deviation to the fourth power. Data that are less than one standard deviation from the mean, so if that x, if any individual unique value or the group of unique values, if that's close to the mean, then basically it'll have no effect really on the kurtosis. However, with data that's further away, where that x actually spreads out very far, you're going to have very l much larger values there, uh, and it most certainly will have a greater effect, and therefore the outliers, especially extreme outliers, will have a greater effect on the kurtosis. So the key there is to think of if you have large extreme values, it's going to modify that x. Uh, and how that x operates will change that numerator.